Okay, so this was about hyperparameter search, okay? But now there is an underlying question also as well on how our model are behaving. Uh, we know that they are brittle and spurious. So let's just see a little bit what this means. Brittles mean that if we change a little bit the input, we kind of see weird behavior. Like this was very, uh, very visible on, uh, on the Jia and Yang paper on, on Squad. They show that if you add like a random sentence at the end of a Squad um, context, like the answer that the model predicts for the question are totally different. The model is just lost because with, with this very small modification, we've, we've left the training domain, okay? But our models are also spurious. Spurious mean that they will really do the, the least amount of work to get the best performances. So if there are easy heuristics that they can leverage, for instance, like we've talked about lexical overlap, when you have a lot of overlap on the um, two sentences of uh, NLI, of MNLI, like the model will very quickly learn that a lot of overlap means that the right classification should be attainment. But this is not what we would like. We would like our model to go to the semantic meaning of the sentence and not just to stay on the surface form, just to stay on the lexical overlap uh, heuristics. So this is called spurious. And it's also mean our models are, are very fragile because in both these cases, when we leave a little bit the, the training data set, the model gives wrong prediction and fail in unexpected ways. So how can we solve that? There are various well. Well, one way would be first to get better ideas of how they behave. And I think here linguistics is very important. There's this nice uh, talk by Eli Pavlik, uh, why we should care about linguistics. Well, I think it's really the time for linguistic to, 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 become, to come back to NLP and to replace some, uh, some of the machine learning approach and to help design better evaluation, okay? Because we know that these linguistics rules, they're kind of the in underlying rules we would like our models to learn. So they are probably good, not, not, not to, try to build training data set, but they are probably very good to build evaluation data set and failure evaluation data set, okay? Now, what we really want to do is to try to provide good inductive biases, which means that our models will want to learn these rules. They will be, uh, it will be easier for our model to learn these rules than to learn these heuristics, which is called an in inductive biases. That, will, that means the model goes toward the solution that we want faster than toward the solution that we don't want. So one idea is all the work on composition IT that we show. We know that composition IT is important for the model to get the good, um, the good understanding of the meaning of a sentence. So if we can build models that are good on composition IT, that would be one way to incorporate some linguistics. So this is one possibility. So how, how can we do that? Well, we can trick the architecture of the model. This model, they have these attention heads. So we can try to encode in these attention heads some of this graph that we see in linguistics, like dependency graph or like shallow, like a SRL um, <clears throat> relation. And this was the nice work, for instance, from uh, Emma Strubel, the LISA, the Linguistically Informed Self-Attention for Semantic World Labeling. That was the best paper at the MNLP uh, two years ago, I think where some of the attention head were actually trained with um, additionally augmented data with semantic role labeling. Okay, and the model reached better performances because it was able to incorporate this, this uh, inductive biases. There is a lot of nice work as well on graph convolu convolutional network. Uh, for instance, this work by, uh, by Diego and Jos Basting and Ivan Titov, where they explore the uh, semantics in translation with graph neural network encoding the, the dependency trees. Okay, so you can try to force the architecture. Another uh, different way is to try to uh, add this inductive bias in the training data. Here is one funny example. Uh, it's an anonymous paper on a, an open review. I think it's very nice. They try to help BERT um, by providing after the training sample for BERT, like a, a form of uh, a semantic role labeling. So they will say, okay, this word is um, like uh, a predicate, uh, this work is the first argument, okay? They add this, this uh, semantic role labeling information after the training. So this forms like a, a, just a, the input for the model. And then at test time, you just don't, re you just don't use this. You just don't, you don't input the augmented data. And you see that the model actually gets improved robustness by being trained with this information, okay? 
they experimented on an adversarial swag that swag data set. Okay, so now probably what we want to do for that is that we probably want to work on pre-training to get some deeper linguistic information in our pre-training data set as well. Like, um, for instance, we can add uh, more like linguistically informed panel level representation. We can try to uh, have like more um, modular way to pre-train our models. And this is all very open, but how can we incorporate this linguistic information in pre-training will be probably important as well. An alternative way to make this model robust is to add common sense, because usually they are lacking some uh, linguistic stuff, but as well as common sense. There are some limits. So why do we need common sense? <laughs> because we can't learn everything from text. Uh, let's have a look. You know that, for instance, um, a sheep are white, okay? But in text, usually we don't say that because it's too obvious. And on the contrary, we often talk about black sheep because, um, yeah, because that's a common expression, okay? So when you ask a model that was trained on text only, when you ask it, what color is, is a sheep? It will say, oh, I, I'm not sure, it's probably black, okay? Because it has no way to know that white is the, the, the real answer, okay? This is called the, the reporting bias. It means that in text, we usually don't state the obvious. Uh, we don't write common sense. So how can we help the model learn that? Well, there are various ways. We can try to add like a knowledge base. In the knowledge base, we like have a, this sheep node and we connect it with color white node. So the model can learn that this is the color of a normal sheep. We can add multi-model. When you show a picture to the model, with a white sheep and the model can just look at it and say, oh yeah, okay, it's white, I can see it on the picture. And then the last part is maybe you can just tell the model. We can have like human in the loop training, like uh, humans are actually learning. We, the model can ask, what color is the sheep? And then the human or some, somebody say, yeah, it's white. And then the model knows it. So this is human in the loop training. These are all the way, but you can see that all of them involve something other than text. We need something like uh, more structured, like a database, or we need like a picture. We need another modality for the model to be able to learn common sense. So Ye Jin Choi has been, uh, has been working a lot of common sense. She's done really, really great stuff. Um, the, the first question is, what is common sense? Uh, what is common sense? It's this basic level of practical knowledge in everyday situation. There is a very blurry, blurry frontier with bias, okay? Because some part of this common sense is exactly bias that we don't want in our model. But some part is just normal thing, like here, it's okay to keep the closet door open, but it's not okay to keep the fridge door open because the food doesn't want to go warm, okay? So the way they did that, the way they tackled that is to build a lot of that sets. They build uh, like, a lot of data sets that try to gather some common sense. And I really want to highlight some of them. Vino Grande is, is really a fascinating one. It's an extension. Now the Winograd schema challenge is solved. Okay, we've started with that uh, later on, uh, earlier. And now they build a successor to it, which is uh, Vino Grande. They have all this uh, common sense, uh, Cosmos QA, a uh, lot of visual common sense that said they're all very interesting. And let me just show you, maybe if you want to read just three paper, uh, you should read probably Atomic, Comet, and the Vino Grande paper. Atomic is this relation database uh, that I was talking about, okay, that encode common sense, so they crowdsource this. Comet is a nice paper by uh, Antoine Boslut. It's about using uh, transformers, pre-trained transformers to actually augment this uh, knowledge graph. And Vino Grande is the successor to uh, Vino Grande schema. So let me show you just a little bit about Vino Grande, okay? Because that's interesting. We are building all these data sets from crowdsource information. And actually, it's very hard to build nice crowdsourcing setup. And I think there are a lot of experience on this topic, which is very interesting. So uh, here, Vino Grande, the main problem is that we don't want people, first, we want people to have ideas and not to generate from just the simplest, uh, the simplest uh, ideas they have. So they use some uh, way to enhance the creativity with what they call random anchor words. So the people in the crowdsource, uh, the, um, you know, the Turkers, 
they will have this random word that they are supposed to use in their example, the example they are writing. And this helps a lot to make them like creatively uh, create new examples. And they also use like a very strong data validation um, setup where they fine tune state of the art models on the data and they try to remove the data that's too easy to predict. Okay, so this could be like a like an online data creation process where each time you have a better state of the art model, you actually prune new examples, okay, to remove them. And they show that the state of the art model from now, they have like very bad performances on this. Well, pretty bad. And we, you, you would need actually a lot of samples to get to human performances. So that's probably the way forward in creating crowdsourced data set, like trying to make more diversity and try to filter this data set better. Okay, and this leads us to the same idea for models. Okay, the data sets should now be evolving. They should be uh, dynamically updated as the new models came, uh, come in. And the models have actually the same problem, which is called the continual learning question. What is it? So that's the end of the, that's the, end of the discussion. It means that BERT was trained on like 2018 data. It will always think that the president of uh, like the United States was the 2018 president, okay? But maybe this will change in the future. Maybe the president, maybe the like the countries will change, and the model will just never learn this, okay? And how do we overcome that? Well, we need models that are able to evolve over time, okay? But then there is the main problem with this approach. There are a lot of people have been working on continual learning. The main problem is called catastrophic forgetting, which means that you want to learn new stuff without forgetting everything that you've learned before. And here you have different approach to try to tackle this from memory to regularization to dynamically growing models. And this is probably the way like NLP should go forward to have these models that are able to adapt and that are able to generalize to other domain as well. Okay, so that's the end for today. That was a very long talk. Uh, I hope you really liked that. And um, the plan for our NLP series is to do like a lot smaller talk in the future with like more basic uh, information. So if you like this, um, you can say it uh, and you can send us feedback and we continue with an NLP series as well.